Come on, party people, put your hands together if you're just pumped to be in the house of God tonight on a Tuesday night in Houston, Texas. Man, God is good. And all the time, for y'all that didn't hear me the first time, I said God is good. And all the time, man, I'm so pumped to be here tonight. I just need to honor some very important people in the house. That's our first time guest. If it's your first time, welcome home. Welcome to Grace, young adults. Listen, if you've not gotten the chance to meet some of our team, we'd love to meet you right after service. Put a gift in your hand. If you've been looking for a place to attend you found home. We've been praying for you. One more time, put your hands together for all of our first-time guests in the building. Well, we are jumping into uh, week two of our series, Non-Negotiables. Everybody say Non-Negotiables. Non-Negotiables. And so we found ourselves in Acts chapter two. How many of y'all got your Bible tonight? Come on, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Put them up. Put them up. Put them up. That's a lot more Bibles than last week. Come on, somebody praise God in this place. Let's go. That's a lot more Bibles. I like that. I like that. How many of y'all got a Bible, like just a brand new Bible? Go ahead and put, put your hands up. Come on, that's a few of us. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So last week we, we started uh, discussing non-negotiables found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So you could head there and it says, and they... They is the, the new church, the apostles, the, these disciples, the new church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to breaking of bread and the prayers. The first non-negotiable for the Christian faith was the word of God. So last week we discussed the word of God and the importance of the word of God. We had an acronym for Bible, B-I-B-L-E. It was basic instructions before leaving earth. That's right. Basic instructions before leaving earth. So if you're trying to figure it out before you get out of here, that's the book to read, okay? Uh, basic instructions before leaving earth. We understood and, and started to discuss that the word of God, the word that became flesh, the word of God saves us, the word of God frees us, and the word of God confronts us. So Jesus, he saved us, his words free us, and his words confront us. And so we see that a non-negotiable in our life is the Word of God. Now we ask you to bring your Bibles and we're challenging everybody to start bringing their Bibles every single week that if you did not have a Bible, go out and get one. We also said if you could not get one, that we would like to help you. There are people here that want to sponsor you. And as a matter of fact, my friend uh, came up to me earlier. I saw you sitting over there, and I don't know if you want to be anonymous, but you're sitting over there with the red hat, and so everybody give him a hand. Um, and so he came up to me before service, and he said, I want to sponsor somebody. Come on. And so I got a new Bible, y'all. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Who needs a Bible? Come on, who needs a Bible? You right over there. I see you with the first thing. Yeah, you right there. Come on, get up. Get up, run over here. Come on. Hustle up, hustle up, hustle up. Come on, put your hands together as she makes her way down to the stage. Would this Bible transform your life? Will it, will it speak to you in the times that you need it the most? And when I say it, would God speak to you? Don't depart from it. Remember the investment that God made in you and the investment that that young man just made into your life. We love you. Here you go. It's very important that we have the word of God in our life, that we prioritize it. If you've not invested in getting one yourself, make sure you do that. If you are wanting to be uh, an investor in, in, in getting somebody, sponsoring somebody, we're going to have a QR code that will actually come up. If you're needing a Bible, a QR code will come up. And, and we're saying if you're needing a Bible, you're unable to purchase one yourself. If you can purchase one, then invest in yourself. If you cannot purchase one, 
then we want to help you as a church. We want to resource you. We want to get a Bible in your hand. And we have a lot of people in this building that want to resource you and love you and invest in getting a Bible in your hand. So the QR code is there. Make sure you scan it. But last week, a non-negotiable was the Word of God. How many of y'all believe that a non-negotiable is the Word of God? Come on, somebody. This week, as we continue to read in Acts Chapter 2, verse 42, we'll see what another non-negotiable is. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. fellowship. The word fellowship is a Christianese word. Any of y'all speak fluent Christianese? What I'm talking about for y'all who don't know what Christianese is, is y'all remember when you first started coming to church and people were speaking in the hallway and you kind of like, they were speaking English, but you didn't understand what they were saying. They had their own lingo. They were saying things that just didn't make sense. That, that's Christianese. Uh, they, were, were, they were saying things and sentences that, uh, why are you saying things like that? That don't make sense. And so even the songs that we sing, sometimes they're Christianese. Y'all ever heard? Um, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For the new Christian, they'd be like, no, keep that blood right in your veins. I don't want that, right? <laughs> keep it in your veins. Uh, that's Christianese. Um, there, there are these phrases that people say, Christians say, and other Christianese phrases, sitting under the word of God. Mm. Mm -hmm. what, do you what do you mean, sitting under the word of God? Like, you just like, sit, like what does that mean? Now, that's when, like, you, you're walking in the hallway and, and, and you hear uh, Elizabeth Ruth and, and, and Rebecca Grace talking, and they're like, oh, my God, it was so good last weekend just sitting under the word of God. <laughs> Oh, like what? <laughs> it's Christianese. Uh, another phrase is, man, he was speaking a word. He was speaking a word. Some of y'all, if, if I repost an Instagram post to somebody else, they PR was speaking a word. And y'all like, no, he spoke more than just a word. It's, it's 915. We got to get out of here. He need, to, he need to take some words back. He need to keep some words to himself. He was speaking a word. It's Christianese. Uh, one of my favorite phrases is, is, to love on you. Mm, mm, Y'all probably hear it every single week, man. You made a decision to follow Jesus. Man, we're so excited for you. How about you he head to the next steps? We have, we have a resource for you. We got some leaders there that want to love on you. And I know we're sending mixed signals because you're like, you just told me to wait for marriage. Now you're telling me to go to the booth for somebody to love on me. I'm just, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. It's Christian needs. Get with it. You're going to get lost. <laughs> The last phrase uh, I'd like to discuss is a phrase that we say, doing life together. Yeah. Doing life together. You might have walked past the small group, the connections booth over there, and they're like, hey, what small group are you going to? And what's the small group? Oh, that's when we just kind of get together, and, and we start, we're doing life together. Doing life together. It's Christianese. Fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. Fellowship, fellowship is a Christianese word that implies doing life together. The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Everybody say koinonia. koinonia. And that is a community or to hold in common with one another. And a non-negotiable for these believers, these early believers in Acts chapter 2, they, they devoted themselves to doing life in a community with like-minded people. And if you're here today, you're in this church building, you're here because you have something in common with the person next to you. You have something in common with the person sitting in front of you and sitting behind you. They came into this building because they want to further their relationship with Jesus. They want to grow in their relationship with Jesus. You have found a place where you have found community. You have found fellowship. And I believe if you're here tonight, you have found your people and so if you're, you're taking notes tonight, the title of the message is, I found my people. I found my people. I found my people. The early church found its fellowship and its community in a church. So hear this. So for me to be devoted, or so for me to devote myself to fellowship is to say that a non-negotiable is that I must commit to attending church. I need y'all to hear what I just said. I need you to commit to attending church because that's a non-negotiable in the Christian faith. There's so much life being in a church. 
so much life committing myself to being a part of a local church. But I find that people downplay the importance of a Bible-believing, God-fearing, Holy Spirit-breathing church. They downplay it like it doesn't make sense. And instead, they'll devote their weekends to a scripture-neglecting, God-ignoring, spirit-absent club. I, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I didn't, I did say it. I said it with my chest. Okay. I said it with my chest. How many people neglect getting into a church that is God fearing, Bible believing, Holy Spirit breathing. They neglect to do that, but they have no problem devoting their life to a place that neglects the word of God. That's a problem. And the early believers devoted themselves. It was a non-negotiable for the Christian faith to prioritize being in godly community over that which pulls you away from God. It was a non-negotiable. It was like a no-brainer. If I had the option between the two, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to where the godly people are. It's a non-negotiable. A non-negotiable for the Christian faith is to commit myself to attending church. I saw a quote from Pastor Tony Evans that put into perspective the importance of attending church. He said this, I hear people say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. How many times have we heard that? And they are absolutely right. Salvation is through faith alone and Christ alone. But you don't have to go home to be married, but stay away long enough and your relationship will be affected. That's a word, somebody. That's a word for somebody. The longer you go without fellowship, the more your Christian walk will be affected. That is why we see in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together. Everybody say neglecting. neglecting. Say meet together neglecting. as is the habit of some. No, you don't have to repeat that part. I'm just neglecting and me together. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as the day draws near. As the day is drawn. Scripture tells us do not neglect the gathering together. It made me ask the question, what is the typical response of the person who walked away from church? What, what is the typical response of the person who neglects the gathering together? What is, the, I started asking myself that question. And, and the typical response is that they also walk away from God. They don't just walk away from church and then everything is good. When they walk away from church, they walk away from koinonia, they walk away from the fellowship they walk away from like-minded a body of believers. Then they walk away from being under the teaching of the word of God. And then they walk away from that teaching so they begin to live a life of sin. And because they live a life of sin, they begin to walk away completely from God. So walking away from the community that is here in the church typically leads to people walking away completely from God. And so... It continues in Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, pause right there. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, so you've come into the community of God, the fellowship, you've received the word of God, the truth of God, and you deliberately continue to sin, it says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. This, the, the sacrifice for sin that Jesus already paid, he paid for you, but you denied it. So there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sin for you. You've denied it. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury fire that will consume the adversaries. Am I saying that people cannot come back to, to Jesus? No, that's not what I'm saying. There's grace for people. Absolutely. But when people deny the community, they walk away from God and begin to neglect the truth of God and begin to sin. It says the fearful expectation of judgment is upon them because they have walked away from the covering of community and the covering of the word of God. Why is it so important to commit to attending a church? Because committing to attending the church keeps the truth of God's word in front of the believer. 
Am I saying that you can't have the truth of God's word at home? I'm not saying that. Am I saying that you can't have the truth of God's word at your dinner table? I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm challenging you, please. I hope you read the word of God more when you're outside of the four walls of the church than when you're inside of the four walls of the church, right? I hope that that's the case for you. But what I am saying is an indication that you are drifting from a genuine walk with God is when you neglect to, you, when you neglect to attend the house of God. What's an indicator for me when I see people no longer attending church? I don't want to point fingers, so I'm talking about your neighbor. But remember... Remember when your neighbor stopped coming to church? How was their relationship with the Lord? Show me a person who walked away from the local church and actually doing better in their faith. That person doesn't exist. It's hard for me to believe that that person actually exists, that they walked away from the local church and they're doing better with their walk with Jesus. Show me that person. It would be hard for me to believe that person exists. We were created to be a part of a community of koinonia, of fellowship. A study facilitated by, uh, there was a study that was facilitated by Harvard. So if, if the word of God wasn't enough. There was a study that was facilitated by a university, Harvard University, and that found that those who attended a weekly service once a week regularly reduce their risk of deaths by despair. Now, what is deaths by despair? Deaths by despair is suicide, it's alcohol poisoning, it's drug overdoses. Those type of deaths are deaths by despair. And so this study by Harvard University was to see, is there a, is there a difference in people in their deaths by despair if they start to go to church? It's not a Christian study. This is a university doing a study. The study concluded that among men, those attending church regularly had about a 33% reduction of deaths of despair. That means men who decided to just say, I'm going to go to church once a week, it reduced their risks of these deaths, suicidal thoughts, being prone to drug addiction, being prone uh, to alcoholism. Like it, it reduced their risk by 33%. That's significant. Just by going to church. Now, for women it's significantly higher. For them to go to church, for you to go to church once a week, the risk of having suicidal thoughts and getting out and going to get drunk and allowing drug abuse to be a part of your life, just by going to church once a week, it was reduced by 66%. This is to say that going to the house of God is, is beneficial for you. This was not a Christian study. This was a university here in the U.S. But if that's not enough, there was a study that was conducted in Oxford, which is in England. And they have what's called the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Health. It says that 78% of people in their study report that church attendance increases their well-being. 73% of people in their study report having more hope. Come on, somebody. 93% of people in their study report having more purpose and meaning in their life. 61% of people in their study report lower rates of depression or faster recovery from depression. And 75% of people in their study report having fewer suicidal thoughts, fewer suicidal attempts, and fewer completed suicides. This is just by coming to church. This is not to say what the Holy Spirit also does, what the Holy Spirit is also able to do when you go into a God-fearing, Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-breathing church. We need to commit to attending church. We see that there is a significant benefit in our life, significant benefit to my life if I attend church. Now, those are studies of people that I don't know. As for me in my life, the church kept me from despair because it's where I learned the word of God. For me, the church kept me from despair because I met others who would encourage me in my faith. The church, the community, the koinonia kept me from despair because I benefited from God's compassion through others. The church kept me from despair because I learned 
that when my praises go up, mm, his blessings come down. Come on. The church has so many benefits. Why would I neglect the gathering together if it has so many benefits? My fear is that the world doesn't know the benefits. My fear is that we keep it to ourselves. I found a place where it's my church. I'm not going to tell no. This is my place where I can, I can find my time with God. And we keep our relationship with Jesus private when it's supposed to be public. Let's tell the world about the benefits of the church. I know I'm not alone when, when I say my world has been crashing down around me. But I came to the church and God began to put it all back together. Not because of the building, but because of the people who decided it was non-negotiable for me to show up to a church. And God used those people to help put my life back together. God has called you the church. Called you to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I'm reminded of this passage of scripture where Jesus was going to church. Come on. Him and his family were in Jerusalem for a festival. And when his parents left that festival, they also left Jesus. We've talked about this before. How are you going to leave God? You know what I'm saying? Don't laugh because y'all be leaving God all the time. <laughs> all right? Yeah, but like, God sit here. I'm going to go to the club this weekend. Right? I'll come back for you. Don't. It's not funny. We shouldn't laugh. All right. They leave Jesus in the church. And when they figure out I left Jesus, they run back. They're looking for him. Where can he be? In Luke 2, it says, after three days, they found him in the temple courts, in the church courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And he says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Didn't you know I had to be in the church? Didn't you know I had to be in the temple courts? Didn't you know I had to be in the house of God? And then I'm reminded of a scripture. We, um, every once in a while, the interns, we get to preach to each other. And, and, and Matt Garcia, Matt Garcia, right over here. Put your hands together for Matt Garcia. Matt Garcia, he brought a word today, and he reminded me of a passage of scripture about this woman by the name of Hannah. Everybody say Hannah. Yeah. Hannah, she desired to have children so badly. And she prayed and believed, and she tried and tried and was unable to have children. And so she decided, I'm going to go to the place where I feel and know I can find some answers. And so we see in 1 Samuel, Samuel verse 1, once when they had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look at your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And then we skip to verse 17. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked for. I see that Jesus as a child went to learn about the word of God and Hannah went to receive a word from God. And I just need to tell you that the church is a place where you can come and learn the word of God, but also you can come and receive a word of God. You can receive a word for yourself. You can receive a word for your future. You can receive a word over your past. The church, the house of God is a place where you can go and receive. Commit to getting into a church. Commit to attending a church. The word fellowship means community, right? But it also means to hold in common. As I thought about the phrase to hold in common, it made me think of what it means when you hold in common with one another. That's when you are like-minded, you have the same habits, the same beliefs, the same standards. If I was talking to the team earlier, if I hold in common with you um, a, a something that I enjoy doing, like I like to go golf. Okay, so we like to go golf. And then you decide to cheat on me and go play pickleball with your homies. But we used to hold in common the fact that we golf together. Something that we do together. When I see that you are no longer talking about golf and you are no longer 
going to play golf and you're no longer hit me up about golf, we no longer hold things in common. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to press you about it. Hey, why, why aren't you with me? What's his name? I'm going to keep you accountable. We holding each other in common. We're holding each other accountable to the things that we find necessary in our life. In the Christian faith, to hold in common is to keep accountable. It's to have people in your life that are like-minded. They love Jesus like you like Jesus. They serve Jesus the way that you serve Jesus. They use their gifts for the Lord the way that you use your gifts for the Lord. You hold in common together. And when you realize that things start to slip in that person's life, you hold them accountable. That's why it's so important to commit to engaging in a small group. Because those are the people that hold you accountable when things start slipping. When you used to hold in common the fact that I attend church every week, and you start slipping and don't attend church every week, and you no longer hold those things in common together, they call you out for it. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, it says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. How many of us are walking this life without fellowship? Walking this Christian faith without fellowship. And when we fall, we have nobody to lift us up. No one to keep us accountable. No one to sharpen us. Proverbs 7, uh, 27, 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they serve his hidden agenda. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. People who are in your life, who have things in common with you about the faith, and when you begin to slip, they begin to cut you. Turn to your neighbor and say, I cut you. Except if you got a criminal record. Don't say that because we got cops ready to come and get you. I'm not playing with you. We will snatch you up yesterday. <laughs> Throw away the key. Zip it up. I'll cut you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend because they're concerned about you. You know what I've noticed is that we have a generation of people growing up, and I've said this before and I've never said it on the stage, but I'm going to say it now. We have a generation of people who are growing up that are weak. That you can't say nothing to them. Because I'm offended. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'm looking for someone who will come into my life and cut me. Someone who will tell me that I've slipped and cut me. Somebody who tell me I've fallen and cut me and tell me to get back up. Way better is it for two people to be together because if you fall down by yourself, no one's going to pick you up. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'm tired of being weak. I'm tired of people not being able to take criticism, constructive criticism. There, there's a difference between people just kicking you while you're down and, and people saying, listen, you're better than that. I've seen what you can do. I've seen what you have done. I've, I know what God has called you to do. You are better than that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And you find the wounds of a friend when you get in koinonia, when you get in community. If you could join a small group, they devoted themselves to fellowship. It was a non-negotiable. It was a non-negotiable. We see Jesus literally was rolling with a small group. He was rolling with 12 people all the time, a small group. He, what I love is that he picked them all from different places, different walks of life, picking them. And what was he doing? He was taking them out of the world's small group and putting them into a spiritually led small group. 
And that's what a small group here at Grace or hopefully at your church, if you have another home church, looks like. Is that they are trying to get you away from the small group of the world. And they're trying to get you to a place where you are in a group of people that will sharpen you and push you to Jesus. He was in a small group. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Too often we give ourselves way too much credit. And we want to hang around the people with bad character thinking that they're not going to corrupt us. You think you a super saying saint. You think you got it all figured out. Oh, we got, oh, I'm good. Don't worry. I'm good. If I go to this, like, I'm going to just show face at the party. I'm just going to show face. I was the king of showing face. But then I showed it off. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Ain't no showing face. Ain't no stopping by and then leaving. We give ourselves way too much credit. You think we're too strong. We're not. You think that you're going to deceive the enemy? You don't think he's seen this play out millions of times before you? That, like, begins to convince us. Ain't no, ain't no weapon formed against me will prosper. And you in bed with her. Like, what you talking about? <laughs> I'm going to talk about it, right? This is my friend. Well, you're my friends. Y'all my friends. I could talk about it. There's no weapon on the beginning. It won't work now. Some of y'all gonna put that on your playlist tonight. <laughs> I'ma stop. <laughs> Cause I'll just do the entire song. Cause I love it. I love it. <laughs> Man, we're not as strong as we think we are, but he is. He is. But there are times in our life where we just decide we're going to walk away from the people who are trying to keep us in the right path. And I'm going to do this by myself. And we fall. And God has implemented a formula for us to walk in. And he said, a non-negotiable for you is to get in community with people who will sharpen you. People who will tell you things that you don't want to hear. I hate hearing things I don't want to hear. You ever go to the doctors and they tell you something you, you didn't want to hear? I didn't want to hear that. You ever go to the mechanic? Period. That's it. I'm done. I'm not going no more. I'm walking. These boots are made for walking. Every time I go, they tell me something I don't want to hear. I come with my own diagnosis, huh? The tires. Fix the tires. That's it. Don't tell me nothing else. The tires. Why are you looking in the trunk? I said the tires. Sir, I'm just getting the spare. I'm just getting the spare. Okay. Every time I go, I hear something I don't want to hear. But it's to benefit my vehicle. It's to get my vehicle running the way that it was intended to run. If I don't hear what I don't want to hear, and I continue to run it to the ground, it's going to die. It's going to fall apart. I need to be okay with hearing things that I don't want to hear because they are a benefit to us. And when you get into a community, a fellowship, a small group, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Don't be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Paul continues to write, he writes in Galatians, to a group of people who were doing well. And they started to, to corrupt the word of God and, and, and the way that they thought. It says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? There are small groups that are not 
Bible believing God fearing Holy Spirit breathing small groups that we attend every day it could be the people that I play ball with the people I go bike riding with the people I go to the gun range with the people I go uh, Friday night we got game night all of that is a small group whether you put a, a Christian small group title on it or not it's a small group it's a small group. You're doing life with people, with someone. And you can either do life with people who are going to point you to Jesus or do life with people you are running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth. It breaks my heart when I see friends of mine. We used to run together. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Hebrews was talking about you neglect the gathering together. You stopped obeying the truth. Shame on you going on sinning when you have heard the truth. Who hindered you? It's so easy to stop doing the things that God has called you to do when you're hanging around with people that don't do the things that God has called them to do. You chose the, the wrong small group. You chose the wrong community. What I don't need you to do is walk out of here and talk about, man, he doesn't want me to hang out with nobody. I can't have no street friends. I can't do it, man. He's so legal. He's studio, oh, man, I can't stand. I'm never coming to Grace Young Adults again. That's not what I'm saying. Go have your street friends. They need Jesus. They need you. They need you. They need you to sharpen them. They need you to be the faithful friend that cuts them in love, with care, with compassion. They need you. But shame on you if you were running well and you allowed them to hinder you from doing and living out the truth. They devoted themselves. It was a non-negotiable. A non-negotiable. The path I run is oftentimes determined by the ones I run with. Look at the people that you're running with. Look at your circle. Look at your small group. They will tell you where you are heading. If you do not like their final destination, get off of the ride. Find another group. This is not to be callous. This is not to be hard-hearted. No, I love people. I will do anything short of sin to reach you. But what we're not doing is allowing you to influence me so that I walk away from Jesus. I praise God for the men and women that uh, he's put in my life that keep me in the right direction. But you know what? I have a choice whether I stick around them or not. You got that same choice. Because God has put you in this place where you have a community, where you have a church, where you have koinonia, you have a fellowship. He has given you small groups that you could be a part of, that people will challenge you and sharpen you and cut you and get, get you in the right direction. But you have the choice. You have the choice. I want to finish with this last passage of scripture. It comes from Daniel 3. There is this nation it's under the ruling of this king, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar says, when the trumpet sounds, I want you to bow down, bend your knee to this golden image that we've created. Bow to these false gods. And so the entire nation is listening to false teachings, to ideologies, to ways of the world that are opposing God. 
Look at our life right now. Look at our church, our, our, our world right now. Opposition. And so all these people, they hear and they bow their knee to false gods. But we have three individuals named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They decide that I, no matter what, I know that that's what the king is saying. I'm not going to bow my knee because I worship the one true God. And the king says, if you don't bow, anybody who doesn't bow, we're going to throw you into this fiery furnace and you'll die. Shot and shake. Whatever. Do your thing. So the trumpet blows. Everybody bows down. Their knee bows to culture. Their knee bows to society. Their knee bows to what the government tells them to do. Their knee bows. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the king calls for them. So I'm going to give you another chance. Bow. Shout out Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, this is what you're going to do to us. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This is what engaging in fellowship looks like. We see three individuals when pressed by society, pressed by culture, pressed by the government system, when they're pressed to bow down to what is in opposition to God, they stand with each other. And I'm here to tell you that the community that God is calling you to be in is to help you stand when the rest of the world is bowing. It's to help you stand when the world says to bow down to culture. It's to help you stand when the world says to do what the world says to do. It's to stand, this, this fellowship, this community, Koinonia, they devoted themselves to it. I, I think, what would I have done if I knew that I was going to die, there was no question they are going to kill me if I do not bow my knee. Would I, would I have buckled and started to bow? God, after I bow down, I promise you I'll get right back up and I'll start serving you. I'll serve you in the secret place, God. And then you got Shadrach and Meshach saying to Bendigo, no, no, you're going to stand. You're going to stand. Because we believe in the one true God. Who is your Shadrach? Who is your Meshach? Who is your Abednego? Who is the person that when all the fire is coming your way, when the government is oppressing you, when the school system is oppressing you, when your mom, your dad, your boyfriend, your girlfriend is causing you and wanting you to do things that are in opposition to God? Who is your Shadrach, your Meshach? Who is saying, no, 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 no. You're not bowing. We're standing. We're standing. It was a non-negotiable that I'm going to get in a community of people, a church, that I'm going to sit under the Word of God. I'm going to learn from the Word of God. But I'm going to get in a community of people around me that are going to cut me, that are going to stand with me, that when I fall, they're going to pick me up. Who is my community? I... I was standing up there as worship was going on. And I think this was probably the first time that I felt like from the front to the back, I saw hands raised. And I'm not saying this like shows that you're like more spiritual than anybody else, okay? Like if your hands are down, like that's cool. 
But there was something different in the room today. We said it during pre-service prayer, which if you want to come and attend 620, we start praying for the service before you even get here. Because we believe that God is moving and we want to pray believing that God is able to change your life. And, and so we were praying and there was something different in the room. And so we start worshiping and I look from the front to the back, hands lifted everywhere. And I felt God was showing me, this is a group of people that are not going to bend their knee. And I want to prophetically just speak that over you. If you have been timid in your faith, if you have been riding the fence in your faith, would you take courage and look around and see that there are more here with you than, than, than those against you? And not just in this room, but I'm talking about heaven's army, that there are more that are with you than, than those that are against you, that you got more on your team. And I believe that God is raising you up to be a people who stand in the presence of opposition. Stand in the presence of adversity. That you would stand and be strong. With all eyes closed and heads bowed tonight. I think the first stand that you need to take if you haven't already is to stand for Jesus. Maybe you've been coming for some time and you've not made that decision to follow Jesus. and You've bowed your knee to the culture. You've bowed your knee to what society tells you to say and society tells you to believe. And you've bowed your knee. And God has been tugging on your heart saying, it is time for you to stand. If that is you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you would not just lift your hand. This is a message of people standing. On the count of three, if you are ready to stand for Jesus, saying, I want to give my life to him. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to ask him to be my Lord and my Savior. If that is you on the count of three, that you would boldly stand to your feet on the count of three. It says in scripture, when one person comes to know the Lord, that all of heaven rejoices. And this room is going to rejoice because it's the best decision that you can ever make. So if that is you, one, two, three. Right now, stand up to your feet. Stand up to your feet. If that is you, come on. I see you. 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 Come on. I see you. I see you right there. I see you. I see you right there. I see you. I see you. I see you. Come on. I see you right there. I see you right here. I see you. 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 Come on. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you over there. I see you in the back. I see you. 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 Come on. I see you right there. I see you over there. I see you in the back right there. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Come on, man. I see you right there. I see you. I see you. I see you right there. Keep putting your hands together for all these people. I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you right there. I see you, I see you, I see you. Come on. See you right here, see you right here, see you, see you. Right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. Come on, continue to put your hands together until I found every person right there. I see you right there. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you right there. I see you. God sees you, he 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 sees you. He sees you, he sees you, just stood up right now. He sees you right there, he sees you, he sees you, he sees you in the back. He sees you right here, young lady, he sees you right here. Sees you, he sees you, he sees you, he sees you. He sees you right there, and all those that are online, come on, put your hands together for all those that made a decision to follow Jesus tonight. The best decision of your life. Come on, get up on your feet as you celebrate all those that made that decision. That is the best decision that you can ever make in your life. Following Jesus. There's no other decision that is priority. There's no other decision that is greater than that decision right there. We do what we do as a church, as a ministry for moments like that. So that people's names are forever written in eternity. 
It says in scripture that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, that you shall be saved. That he died for your sins. He was raised from the dead. And he is the Lord of your life. So I'm going to say a short prayer, short phrases, and I'm going to ask that you would borrow my words. That this entire room, we're going to pray it together because here at GYA, we don't do nothing alone because we are family. And so say these words, but they don't mean nothing unless you mean them in your heart. So as you borrow these words, that you would mean them in your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for me. I know I've made mistakes. The Bible calls that sin. Forgive me for all my sins. I repent of all my sins. I turn to you. Today I ask that you would be Lord of my life. Today I decide to live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands one more time for all those that made that decision to follow Jesus. Now we have some of our team that's going to get into place so that they can serve you. So don't slip out just yet. The next step for you, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, I want you to meet our team at Next Steps right outside of the hall. As when we dismiss service, you'll be able to meet some leaders over there. They want to resource you uh, with what your next steps in this relationship with Jesus. It's a journey, and we say this all the time, that your relationship with Jesus is not a sprint. It's a... It's a marathon, and so you're going to be running for a long time, and we want to run with you. We want to get you in koinonia. Come on, somebody. We want to get you in the fellowship. We want to get you in a church, in a community, in a small group. So let us resource you. Get there. If your friend stood up and you were peeking, go ahead and take them with you to, to next steps. We want to resource you, resource you and run with you. For the rest of us. I'm going to have my prayer team, if you guys could come up to the front. Prayer team, prayer team, if you could come up to the front. That last part, we were talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Everybody around them bent down to culture. Bent down to what a false god, an idol was. And there's no doubt that we have wrestled with idols in our life. And if you have bent down to an idol in your life, you've become to submit to that which is not from God. And you're saying, God, I want to stand for you. God, I ask for forgiveness of that which I put in priority before you. Whether it be because I was scared of what people were going to say around me or I was scared of the consequences I may get because I don't bend to that or bow to that, whatever it is. And you're saying, I want to renounce that. And I want to stand for Jesus. I want you to feel free to come slip out of your seat and meet with one of our prayer leaders. Our worship team, we're going to continue to worship. But I want you to feel free to come and pray because we want to pray and believe that that which held you captive, that which held you bound is going to break off of you tonight and Jesus is going to set you free. So Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for everyone under the sound of my voice. I pray that as you move, as you Holy Spirit move in this place tonight, that you would break chains, that addictions would break, that Father strongholds would break and that you would begin to set free. So Father, begin to tug on hearts right now in this moment. Lord, would you do your best work tonight? It's in the name of Jesus we pray and we all said amen. Come on, you are free to come up to the altars, worship, come and receive prayer. I
Come on, are you desperate for Jesus tonight? And I don't want anyone else. Yeah. You won't have music when you go home. So sing it now. Give me Jesus. And give me Jesus. And give me Jesus. You can have all this world. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus and give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. And you can have all this world. You can have all this world. And I don't want anyone else you say. I don't want anyone else and I don't need anything else Cause you, you are, are my one thing You are my one thing I don't want anyone else and I don't need anything else You are my one thing And I don't want anyone, I don't want anyone yeah, yeah. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You are my one thing. And I don't want anyone else. Yeah. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. Cause you are say you are my one thing. You are my one thing. You are my one thing. Last time, come on. You are my one thing. You said, you are say, you are my one thing. You are my one thing. Come on, is that the cry of our hearts tonight? 
We don't need music. We don't need all these amazing instruments, but we can go home and sing that you are our one thing. And I love that song because it's the truth of our generation. Like, man, you can have everything else in the world. The money, the cars, all of that. It doesn't last. But what truly lasts is your relationship with Jesus tonight. I just feel Jesus. Can we just lift our hands real quick? We're going to go home. But Father, will you just fill a generation tonight, God? your power and your presence be what leads us and guides us. God, help us not to be influenced by culture. Help us not to be influenced by the things of this world, but help us as sons and daughters of the Most High King to walk out and to live out our faith with confidence and with boldness. So Father, I pray now that as we leave this room, that each and every community that is represented in this room will be impacted. God, that families, their lives, that jobs, their workplaces, that schools will be changed because of the people that are in this room tonight, God. We have so much more in store for us, God. So, Father, we receive it tonight. And we seal it tonight with thanksgiving and praise. And we say, God, you are worthy. And you're the only thing that we want. You're the only thing that we desire. So if you agree with that, can we just lift up a shout of praise tonight? Man, isn't it great to be in the house of God as a family? How many of you feel encouraged by tonight? Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Don't neglect the gathering together. Man, we're so glad that you made it out here tonight. If you have felt convicted after tonight to join a group, we want you to join a group. Get connected in a small group. You can head out there. There's tables, there's booths out there to get you connected. But man, we are so glad that you made it, whether you're online or you're in the room. Don't do life alone. So get connected, get in community, continue to come to church. Next week is our worship night. So we want to see you here. It's going to be in this room. Be a bringer. We're so excited. Again, if you made the decision to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, we want to celebrate you. We're so, Let's give it up for those that made that decision tonight. They're walking out already. So head to the Next Steps table. Man, we're so glad that you came. We'll see you next week for worship night or Sunday at our services, 9 and 11. We're so glad that you're here. We love you.